Before we begin our detective work, we first need to set out the chronology of events that provide the affair's framework. And right away, even before we've started, we see how the affair's initial focus was subsequently airbrushed from the history books. The scandal began during the evening of the 19th of October 1994, when the Labour trade spokesman, Stuart Bell, read out extracts from the next morning's Guardian in the House of Commons. He said, A statement will appear in the Guardian tomorrow, which I should draw to your attention, Mr Deputy Speaker. It says, A top Westminster lobbying company were paid thousands of pounds to give to two high-flying Conservative MPs for asking parliamentary questions at £2,000 a time on behalf of Harrods during the height of the Lono and House of Fraser controversy. The two ministers referred to in the article are the Honourable Member for Tatton, Neil Hamilton, the Minister now responsible for Trade and Industry, and the Honourable Member for Beaconsfield, Tim Smith who is a junior Northern Ireland minister. They were both named in the article as recipients of payments passed to Ian Greer Associates by Mohammed Al-Fayed, the owner of Harrods, on top of a £50,000 fee for a parliamentary lobbying campaign. An examination of the Guardian article shows that Fayed had certainly not said that he had given any money to MPs. To the contrary, The Guardian portrayed Fired as an honourable man who had approached the paper out of a sense of public duty to expose how his lobbyist, a chap called Ian Greer, had bribed the two MPs. Nothing about Fired bribing anybody. All Fired had done, so the story went, was recompense Ian Greer for his outlay to the two MPs. The article quoted Fired as having told the paper, I was approached by Ian Greer who offered to run a campaign. He told me he could deliver, but I would need to pay. A fee of about £50,000 was mentioned. But then he said he would have to pay the MPs, Neil Hamilton and Tim Smith, who would ask the questions. Mr Greer said to me, you need to rent an MP just like you rent a London taxi. I couldn't believe that in Britain, where Parliament has such a big reputation, you had to pay MPs. I was shattered by it. I asked how much and he said it would be £2,000 a question. Every month we got a bill for parliamentary services and it would vary from £8,000 to £10,000 depending on the number of questions. In fact, The Guardian and Fired have never produced any such varying invoices. The airing of the story in the Commons cloaked it in parliamentary privilege, thus enabling the later editions of all the other papers to repeat the allegations the next morning without fear of being sued. Accordingly, they too reported that The Guardian had accused Ian Greer the lobbyist of bribing the two MPs. The Times quoted verbatim what The Guardian claimed Fyred had said including the claim that Ian Greer had billed him varying monthly invoices to recover his payments to the two MPs. Transcripts from the next morning's BBC radio bulletins also record Ian Greer the lobbyist as the accused paymaster. At 7.09, the Today programme discussed Stuart Bell's overnight outburst in the Commons. Mr Bell said that thousands of pounds had been paid by a Westminster lobbying firm Ian Greer Associates to the two MPs as part of the Al Fayed's campaign. That evening, six o'clock bulletin reported The government has spent the day fighting off fresh allegations that it's become tainted by sleaze after more than 15 years in power. The latest controversy centres on claims that two ministers were paid by a firm of political lobbyists to table parliamentary questions while backbenchers. At 9.30pm, the BBC's World Service reported Britain's ruling Conservatives are having to cope with yet another political scandal. This particular set of allegations concerns two government ministers said by The Guardian newspaper to have asked questions in Parliament on behalf of the boss of the Harrods store. They were said to have been paid £2,000 per question by a firm of lobbyists who were employed to argue the businessman's case. During the day, Tim Smith resigned his ministerial position after admitting failing to register fees, not from Ian Greer, 
but from Mohammed Fayyad himself. I'd like to say that uh, I made uh, what was obviously a painful and personal decision in the interests of the government and the Prime Minister. Neil Hamilton, however, served The Guardian with a libel writ, naming the story's author David Henke and the paper's editor Peter Preston, while over in the House of Commons, Prime Minister John Major revealed that three weeks earlier, Fired had tried to prize some sort of deal from him through an intermediary. As the next day's Telegraph reported, Mr Major told MPs that the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Robin Butler, had already investigated the matter on the basis of privately received information. He said it was clear that the allegations originated from, but were not delivered directly by, Mr Fired. But Mr Major surprised the House when he added, I made it absolutely clear at that time that I was not prepared to come to any arrangements with Mr Al Fayed. The Telegraph also speculated, as did the Times, that Fayed had tried to pressurise the Prime Minister into granting him British nationality, and that his failure so to do had been behind his motivation to go public. All the papers featured profiles of Ian Greer, the man at the centre of the storm. There's the Telegraph, the Independent, the Times, the Financial Times, the Sun, Mirror, Daily Mail, Express and Today. Only The Guardian chose not to carry Greer's photo. Several papers reported the responses of all three accused. That Smith had admitted taking fees from Fired and resigned. That Hamilton had denied the charges and issued a writ against The Guardian and that the lobbyist Ian Greer had also denied the charges and would also be issuing proceedings against The Guardian. The Independent reported, The government was rocked yesterday by a fresh scandal when the Northern Ireland Minister Tim Smith resigned after he admitted receiving fees for asking parliamentary questions on behalf of Mohammed Al-Fayed, the owner of Harrods. Mr Hamilton is said by ministerial sources to have repeatedly and convincingly denied, during a series of grillings by senior whips, allegations that he accepted payments through the firm of Ian Greer Associates for asking questions on Mr Fyatt's behalf. Mr Hamilton, MP for Tatton, Cheshire, said in a statement issued by the libel lawyers Peter Carter Rook and Partners, there is no truth in the allegations in today's Guardian that I received payments from Ian Greer on behalf of Mohammed Al Fayed in return for asking parliamentary questions or for any other action. Mr Greer yesterday denied all the claims and said he would take legal action over the allegations. So, before we go any further, we have here a paradox that simply screams out to be reconciled. How could the lobbyist Ian Greer hope to win any libel action over allegations that one of the MPs had seemingly admitted? The answer, as you might have deduced, is that Smith had, in fact, admitted to an activity that the Guardian had not alleged, that is, of receiving undeclared payments from Fired himself. If the BBC, which utterly dominates the British media and which has a public service remit, had made it clear in its reports as it ought to have done, that Smith did not admit the Guardian story. Then in all likelihood the affair would have died a death there and then and Neil Hamilton and Ian Greer would still be enjoying their careers today. In the event, the BBC used passive language and referred to the allegations in general indistinct terms to create the false impression that Smith's resignation was actually a vindication of the Guardian story, thus casting immediate doubt on Hamilton's and Greer's claims of innocence. That evening's BBC 6 o'clock TV news shows how it was done then and how it has been ever since. A government minister resigns over the cash for questions allegations. Tim Smith admitted he accepted money from the owner of Harrods to ask questions in the Commons. The second minister, Neil Hamilton, denies the allegations and is suing for libel. Watching that, you'd think that the Guardian story had at least been right in Smith's case. But it wasn't, and it never has been. And it seems clear that the BBC's misleading script was not accidental. 
Transcripts from the next morning's Today programme show that the affair was discussed at least four times. 6.35, 7.10, 7.50 and 8.16. But though Ian Greer was the man at the very focus of its reporting the previous morning, and though Greer was again the focus of that morning's papers, the Today team opted not to mention Ian Greer in any of those four reports. And so, having been allowed to escape scrutiny, the Guardian's story accusing Greer the lobbyist was quietly allowed to disappear off the radar, whereupon it would then be able to mutate before it resurfaced some time later. Then, the next morning's Daily Telegraph reported that between January 1987 and November 1989, Fired had met Tim Smith and Neil Hamilton 19 and 21 times respectively. It reported... Mr. Hamilton confirmed last night that he met Mr. Fired quite frequently in the years concerned, both at Harrods and at Mr. Fired's offices in Park Lane. The meetings were entirely to do with House of Fraser and Lonro and related issues, he said. There was still no suggestion at this stage that Fired himself had paid Hamilton. The next day, the News of the World reported that Fired now claimed to have given Hamilton £15,000 of Harrods gift vouchers allegations which Hamilton also denied. With pressure mounting, the following Tuesday, Prime Minister John Major forced Neil Hamilton to resign to the back benches. Later that day in the Commons, he announced an official inquiry into the whole issue of standards in public life. In response to a question from the floor of the House as to whether Fired should be prosecuted for trying to blackmail the government, Major revealed that he had already sent the Director of Public Prosecutions a note of his meeting with Fired's emissary, over Fired's demands that the damning 1990 DTI report be revised or withdrawn. The next day's papers zeroed in on Fired's crude attempt to pressurise the Prime Minister. Except The Guardian, which focused instead on Hamilton's resignation. A week later, Neil Hamilton served The Guardian with an eight-page statement of claim. Another two weeks later, on the 21st of November, in what was his first public opportunity to deny the charges, Neil Hamilton used a Commons debate to plead his innocence and to denounce the British press. As the Times reported, In his first Commons speech since his resignation as Corporate Affairs Minister, Mr Hamilton condemned the media for having a terrifying power to destroy, which was undermining public confidence in politics. He insisted, there is no sleaze in government. Speaking in the debate on the Queen's speech, he regretted the lack of any forthcoming legislation against the press and demanded stringent new regulations to keep the media in check. We are now faced with a situation in which the press, both broadsheet and tabloid, are sometimes prepared to go to any length to undermine the authority of our institutions, he added. A free press was essential to modern democracy, he conceded, but a licentious press is subversive to it. Acting on Fired's instructions, two weeks later in the first week of December, Fired solicitors wrote a confidential letter to the chairman of the parliamentary committee that policed MPs' behaviour, the Members' Interests Committee. The letter set out that, in addition to Ian Greer paying Hamilton, Fired was now saying that he too had paid Hamilton £20,000 in cash plus £8,000 of Harrods gift vouchers handed over in 12 private meetings between 1987 and 1989. When he heard about the letter, Hamilton denied these new allegations too. This was the first time that Fired had said that he himself had paid Hamilton. And though it was clearly a major development in the story, no news about it leaked out into the press. The quiet transformation of the story was taking place. A week later, The Guardian delivered its defence, which now encapsulated both quite distinct allegations that Greer and Fired had paid Neil Hamilton. Two weeks later, on New Year's Eve, The Guardian published its review of the year. However, in the account of its cash for questions story, there was no mention of the lobbyist at its centre, Ian Greer. Instead, the writer, 
the paper's then diarist, Alan Rusbridger, used passive language to avoid stating who the briber was. In his Chronicle of the Events of October, Rusbridger wrote, The Guardian published claims that two Conservative ministers had accepted cash in exchange for asking questions on behalf of Mohammed Al-Fayed, the owner of Harrods. One of them, Tim Smith, admitted the charge and resigned. The other, Neil Hamilton, denied it and clung on in office. The use of passive language here allows Rusbridger to create the false impression that Smith's resignation bore out the Guardian story. Such misleading journalism could not have been accidental. Nevertheless, four weeks later in January 1995, the unique journalist-run body that owns the Guardian, the Scott Trust, selected Alan Rusbridger as the paper's new editor, replacing Peter Preston. Two months later in April, the Guardian then took out a new High Court action to compel Hamilton's and Greer's cases to be heard jointly as one in what lawyers call a consolidated action an event that would have disastrous consequences for Neil Hamilton, as we shall see. Two months later in June, both sides then exchanged witness statements. A month later in July, The Guardian embarked on legal moves to block the case from coming to court. Its lawyers argued that the legal parliamentary privilege that each MP enjoys, which means effectively that outsiders cannot question MPs' behaviour in Parliament, would prevent The Guardian from being able to defend itself properly. The judge agreed, stopping Hamilton and Greer in their tracks. Another nine months later, on the 2nd of April 1996, the crossbench peer Lord Hoffman moved an amendment to a bill that was going through Parliament at the time, the Defamation Bill, to allow an MP to waive for the purposes of those proceedings, so far as it concerns him, the protection of any enactment or rule of law which prevents proceedings in Parliament being impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. This amendment, if successful, would allow Hamilton and Greer to continue with their libel actions against the Guardian. And, though it had been announced on the floor of the House of Lords, the Guardian didn't learn about it until four weeks later in May, and it didn't like it when it did. But despite heavy opposition on the Labour benches, Parliament eventually voted through the amendment another two months later in June, meaning that Hamilton and Ian Gray, the lobbyist, would at last be able to have their day in court. A date was set for the trial, Tuesday, October the 1st, 1996. Then a curious thing happened. With less than four days to go before the start of the trial, during the afternoon of Friday, September the 27th, the Guardian quietly delivered to Neil Hamilton's and Ian Greer's solicitors three witness statements dated that same day, signed by a doorman, a secretary and a former secretary from Fyde's Park Lane office block, all claiming to have processed cash payments to the MP and the lobbyist. Clearly, the last-minute emergence of these people is deeply suspicious, especially given the fact that in June the previous year, Fyatt had stated explicitly in his witness statement that there hadn't been any witnesses to his payments. Back then, Fyatt had solemnly stated, Our meetings were alone, and although my diary confirms the dates of the meetings, no one else would have seen the money being given to Mr Hamilton. Overleaf, Fyatt left no room for any doubt. He said, I can therefore confirm that cash payments were made to Mr Hamilton in two ways. Firstly, in face-to-face -face meetings, and secondly, through Ian Gray. Fired specifically excluded the possibility of anyone else being involved. Now, with just a few days to go, three witnesses appear out of the ether, all claiming to have processed cash payments to both Hamilton and Greer. Confusingly, three hours before The Guardian delivered these statements, Hamilton's and Greer's joint legal team announced that they would have no choice but to cease representing both men after deciding that a conflict of interest had recently developed between them. This being a consolidated action they were required to do by their professional codes of conduct. This meant that Hamilton and Greer would have to assemble and brief a new legal team apiece with the trial merely days away. Clearly, an impossible task. 
We'll discuss these events in detail later in chapter 13. And so, on Monday, September 30th, on the eve of the trial, and despite all the efforts that they had undertaken to bring the case to court, Hamilton and Gray withdrew their actions against the Guardian without a shot being fired. The Guardian asked for a £15,000 contribution to their costs. The two men reluctantly agreed, thus enabling the Guardian thereafter to claim victory. However, the Guardian has never sent Hamilton or Gray a demand for that £15,000 and it remains unpaid. Later that day, Hamilton issued a statement maintaining his innocence and announcing that he'd written to the leader of the House of Commons requesting an official inquiry into the whole affair. His wish was granted and the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, Sir Gordon Downey, was asked to investigate. The next day's Guardian showed no mercy to the two men. Most significantly, despite having these three new sensational witnesses on side, the only coverage the Guardian gave them consisted of an unsigned small item made up of extracts from their signed statements. Instead, the Guardian now overcame its shyness about Ian Greer and put him back at the centre of the affair, with heavy coverage over several weeks implying that the lobbyist had woven a web of corruption in the Conservative Party. This is the next morning's issue of Tuesday, October the 1st. This is Wednesday's. And this is Thursday's. Later that day, Tony Blair sacked his employment spokesman in the Lords, the lifelong trade unionist Baroness Turner of Camden, simply because she had sat on the board of Ian Greer's lobbying company and had staunchly defended him. On Saturday, the Guardian accused the government of enacting a cover-up, as did the Guardian Sunday paper The Observer the next day, which argued how the affair had tainted British democracy. After a week, the story was still going strong. By Monday, the Guardian was starting to imply that Greer had also embroiled Prime Minister John Major in his web of corruption. The next day's Guardian carried an ICM poll showing that 62% of voters thought that Neil Hamilton should resign, with 42% believing that lobbying companies harm democracy. As for Ian Greer, despite having resigned from his company in order to give it a fighting chance of staying in business, on the 19th of December he placed it into voluntary liquidation with undisclosed debts. Another four weeks later, on the 16th of January 1997, The Guardian launched its book on the affair, Sleaze, which, as the puff piece in that morning's Guardian makes clear, also focuses on Ian Gray. Then, on January the 28th, after a three-month delay caused by The Guardian's failure to provide information, the paper's allegations were at long last formulated and so Sir Gordon Downey's parliamentary inquiry finally had its basis on which it could proceed. But before Downey had time to complete his report, two months later on March the 17th, Prime Minister John Major prorogued Parliament for a general election to be held on the 1st of May. The Guardian responded immediately by resurrecting allegations against Hamilton which centred mainly on his alleged improper dealings with the lobbyist Ian Greer. In April, the BBC reporter Martin Bell announced he would stand against Hamilton in his Tatton constituency as an anti-corruption candidate, after having first obtained the support of the two opposition parties, who later withdrew their candidates and provided Bell with scores of party workers to help his independent campaign. I believe, and the opinion polls reinforce this, that there is deep disquiet in the public at large about our standards of conduct in public life. And it's it, just a few, but it, contaminate, it, it affects the reputation of the many. And it's in everybody's interest that we sort this out. And I think the British people want this. The media besieged Tatton. 
The Guardian marked the occasion by resurrecting charges against Hamilton, which again focused largely on his dealings with Ian Gray. But despite the onslaught, the Tatton Conservatives stood by their man and selected Neil Hamilton as their official candidate, following which Hamilton distributed this campaign leaflet denying doing anything dishonest or improper, blaming the media and predicting that Downey's inquiry would clear him after the election. Along with hundreds of other Tory MPs, in the event Hamilton was ejected from his seat and the BBC reporter Martin Bell rode into Parliament on a platform of honesty and decency. Two months later in July, Sir Gordon Downey eventually published his report. Exactly as Ian Gray and Neil Hamilton had predicted, he cleared them and the other almost forgotten MP, Tim Smith, of all of the corruption allegations in The Guardian's original Cash for Question story. That is, that Ian Greer, the lobbyist, had paid the two men to ask parliamentary questions. In Hamilton's case, Downey also cleared him of the additional allegations that he'd received gift vouchers and free shopping at Harrods. However, and as we shall see quite bizarrely, Sir Gordon found in favour of the new allegations that had been made for the first time only a few months earlier on the eve of the trial, based on the three fired employees' testimony. Even more strangely, Sir Gordon concluded that their claims to have processed cash payments to Hamilton amounted to compelling evidence, whereas he said that there was only a strong probability that they were telling the truth with respect to their identical claims that they processed cash payments to Ian Greer. As I myself witnessed that day, Hamilton faced a press pack in full bloodlust mode. Notwithstanding the perversity of Downey's compelling evidence punchline, the media gulped it down and reported it with unfettered indignation. Now then, if you're confused, don't worry. This story will come together, just like a jigsaw puzzle, piece by piece, until we can all see the true picture. It might seem complicated at the moment, but the best detective stories are full of paradoxes, and this one is no different. Anyway, back to the story. The next day, The Guardian reported down his findings in a way that created the false impression that he had accepted The Guardian's original story accusing Greer. And, most interestingly, although Downey's guilty verdict against Hamilton depended on the three fired employees, once again The Guardian treated them to very low-key coverage. No pictures, no profiles, no interviews. Nor was there any mention of their last-minute emergence in the paper's chronology of events of the affair. Three months later, in October 1997, Neil Hamilton had the chance to defend himself before the parliamentary inquiry charged with approving Downey's report, the Standards Committee. This issue is exhaustively gone into in a document which I have not been responsible for producing. And I'm grateful to the authors for pointing all this out to me, because I hadn't spotted this either. In a document which I shall be giving to the committee, produced by two independent journalists, wholly unconnected uh, with me, who, after the general election, decided there was a story here worth investigating because they wanted to make a TV programme about it. And they've been working for the last five months. At their In a passionate time. address lasting two and a half hours and quoting directly from a report compiled by Malcolm Keith Hill and myself, encompassing six months of our research, the former MP tore into The Guardian's evidence and Downey's appraisal of it and excoriated Downey's decision to find against him solely on the basis of fired three staff. Then, a month later in November, the committee announced that it could not agree on Downey's verdict. This was a totally unexpected and unprecedented split of the committee. Previously, they had indicated to the Sunday Telegraph that they would endorse Downey unanimously. So when Tory committee members Quentin Davis MP and Anne Widdicombe MP changed their minds, it was an absolutely sensational development. For example, The Guardian had originally quoted Quentin Davis as saying of Downey's report, 
Now you can be certain that the facts have been effectively established. But now Quentin Davis had voted against Downey's report, and he was telling the Daily Telegraph that the affair had degenerated into a discreditable shambles. And when the committee's Labour chairman later misrepresented Anne Widdicombe's abstention as an endorsement of Downey, she actually resigned in protest. The Guardian, meanwhile, reported the committee's failure to agree as being a vote in favour of Downey's report, nine votes to nil, provoking historian Paul Johnson to write a piece for The Spectator characterising the paper's editor, Alan Rusbridger, as Britain's biggest liar. Hamilton pleaded with the committee's chairman to reopen the matter, but to no avail. But still he fought on. Encouraged that some commentators had finally realised that Downey's verdict had, in fact, been based solely on the testimony of Fire's three staff, two months later in January 1998, Neil Hamilton lodged yet another writ for libel at the High Court. But this time not against the Guardian, but rather Mohammed Fayed himself over allegations that he had made in a TV documentary broadcast the previous year on Channel 4. Like the Guardian three years earlier, Fayed responded with legal moves to stop Hamilton in his tracks. Fayed's legal team argued that Parliament had already decided the matter and that the courts ought not to question Parliament's decisions. This time, Fayed had a useful ally too the new Labour government. And so, a year later, in March 1999, the case came back to the High Court. Hamilton won, but fired, hand in hand with the Attorney General, proceeded to fight Hamilton all the way up to the highest court in the land, the House of Lords. But despite their combined efforts, Neil Hamilton eventually prevailed and in October he was finally given the go-ahead to take fire to court. And so, a month later in November, Hamilton's second libel action arrived at the High Court, this time to clear his name of the new allegations involving Fyde's three staff. On the eve of the trial, Fyde's legal team came out with a new allegation that Hamilton had demanded £10,000 from Mobile Oil, for whom Hamilton had once acted as a registered parliamentary consultant, allegations which Hamilton passionately denied. Then, with perfect timing, four days later, the news of the world reported that Tory grandee Lord Geoffrey Archer had won his libel case of 12 years earlier after concocting and considering using a bogus alibi. And no sooner had that story exploded, a series of lurid allegations broke about donations to the Conservative Party made by its treasurer, Michael Ashcroft. Tory sleaze and duplicity were right back in the spotlight just when Hamilton needed it least. A week later, the three fired witnesses gave their testimony, as did Fyde's American lawyer Doug Marvin, who claimed credit for discovering their involvement at the last minute, and that, together with the hotly disputed mobile allegations, made up Fyde's case. Neil Hamilton, his wife and his supporting witnesses then gave their evidence. However, it wasn't enough. Held by five years of media condemnation and censorship, on Tuesday, December 21st, 1999, the jury found against him. Once again, the British press spoke with a unified voice, with most newspapers devoting five or even six pages. The Guardian did as The Guardian does, but for only the second time in this saga, it played down completely Ian Greer's supposed role, as did all the other papers and broadcasters, including the BBC. Whilst also giving the three key witnesses the usual, that is to say unusual, low-key treatment. But the saga still wasn't over yet. Two months later, in February 2000, in a rare example of a British newspaper exposing press corruption, the Mail on Sunday revealed that prior to the trial, Fyatt had paid a freelance journalist called Mark Hollingsworth £10,000 in cash for reams of draft cross-examination papers that another journalist, Benjamin Pell, had stolen from the chambers of Hamilton's barristers. 
Incidentally, Mark Hollingsworth has made his career by attacking Conservative MPs, such as he did with his celebrated book MPs for Hire, in which he argues that Conservative MPs outside business interests were subverting the function of Parliament. Anyway, on hearing the news, Hamilton cried foul and immediately lodged an appeal against the verdict. And so, in December 2000, the case came to the Court of Appeal, headed by the Master of the Rolls, Lord Justice Phillips, accompanied by Lord Justice Sedley and Lady Justice Hale. However, in the event, the learned judges rejected Hamilton's application on the grounds that the jury would not have been swayed had they known that Fyde had acquired his stolen privileged documents, as Fyde's reputation could not have been any lower than it was already. Sadly, the learned judges did not consider that the convincing sincerity with which the three key fired employees had given their evidence could have been conditioned by their having foreknowledge of what they would and would not be asked in the witness box. Hamilton called it justice in wonderland. Following the results, the Guardian again covered the case and this time left Ian Greer completely absent from its report. Not one mention. Similarly, Britain's principal news agency, the Press Association, on which Britain's news media depends, disseminated this bulletin entitled How the Hamilton Affair Unfolded, purporting to be a comprehensive chronology of the affair's events from its very beginnings six years earlier. However, despite the lobbyist Ian Greer being the original alleged paymaster to whom The Guardian had devoted acres of print over the years, the Press Association's comprehensive chronology of the affair did not even mention Ian Greer once. Nor did the chronology mention the changing allegations. Nor did it mention the late emergence of Fyatt's three key staff. So, we've gone from Ian Greer, the alleged briber at the very centre of the scandal for several years, to Ian Greer, a man who didn't have any role worth mentioning. Instead, the case now rests entirely on Mr. Fyatt's suspiciously late emerging three employees. And we know that the case rests on their word alone because the Guardian's own barrister admitted it. In the hubris following Downey's report, and with the prospects of Hamilton ever bringing the case back to court seemingly zero, the Guardian's world famous barrister, Geoffrey Robertson QC, published this book. The Justice Game, chronicling some of his famous cases. In the chapter on Cash for Questions, he describes how, with just six weeks to go before the start of the first libel trial against The Guardian, he was holidaying in Tuscany when he received a call from The Guardian asking him to lead its defence team. He describes what happens next. I rushed back to London to take stock of the evidence. Was there proof that the MP had received thousands of pounds in brown envelopes? The defence case, at this stage, rested largely on the word of Mohammed Al-Fayed. So, just to clarify, The Guardian's world-famous barrister says that six weeks before the trial began, that's nearly two years after Hamilton and Greer served their writs, The Guardian's defence still depended largely on Fayed's word. And it wasn't an error, because a few pages on, Robertson says this about how the three employees saved the paper's bacon at the last minute. It would, under the onerous libel rules, be for the Guardian to satisfy the jury that Al Fayed was telling the truth. They would hear the cross-examination of Hamilton and his counsel's challenges to Al Fayed. The defence case would no longer hinge on his word alone. Now, I'll repeat that because I want you to remember it all the way through this film. The defence case would no longer hinge on his word alone. A few days before the trial, three witnesses came forward to support Al Fayed. There was Alison Bozak. Well, actually, it was Bozek, not Bozak. Now a trainee solicitor with a city firm, who said she had stuffed cash in envelopes for Hamilton and Greer. There was Iris Bond, who recalled currying the cash and preparing envelopes for collection. Then there was a security man at Al Fayed's block of flats in Park Lane, who said he'd handed the plaintiff brown envelopes on several occasions. 
Were these new witnesses all prepared to lie under oath, or would their evidence be compelling? Hamilton had brought this case so that a jury would decide one way or the other. Now then, this is all a bit curious for a political scandal that helped bring down a government, isn't it? What, with Ian Greer going from being the alleged briber at the centre of the affair to being airbrushed out of the story completely? And with the whole case being rescued at the last minute by Mr Fired's three staff? It gets even worse. In his book The Justice Game, Geoffrey Robertson also reveals that the Guardian was not insured for libel and that the destruction of Greer's business caused by the Guardian story could have cost the paper a further £10 million if it had lost the case. He states, The Guardian could not back down. It had staked its credibility on this story. There was no possible compromise, because Neil Hamilton and Ian Greer would not bottle out. The defence case, at this stage, rested largely on the word of Mohammed Al-Fayed. It was the same with Greer, and if the case against him were lost, his unprecedented special damages claim for £10 million would then succeed, at least in part. The Guardian, unlike most publishers, was not insured against libel, a fact which freed it to fight this action, but made it a fight unto the death. So clearly, we have here a fabulous mystery to unravel. Are Mohammed Fayed's employees telling the truth? Did Fayed's American lawyer really discover their involvement at the last minute? Or did Mohammed Fayed coerce them to give false witness at the Guardian's request? And if that is indeed what happened, then why did the Guardian leave it so late before it finally asked Fayed for help? What's the story about Ian Greer? Why did he pull out of his libel action if he was innocent, as he claimed? Why would Neil Hamilton table questions in support of a man like Fired? What exactly were these questions about anyway? What's the story about the Downey inquiry? And above all, why would the uninsured Guardian risk its financial security as well as its reputation by publishing a libelous story that for two whole years depended entirely on the word of a dubious character like Mohammed Fayed? Well, over the next few hours, we will answer all those questions, and we will prove the world's biggest, most destructive, most audacious press cover-up ever to be exposed.